Section 4 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandy Gunther. The Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 1. The Unparalleled Adventures of One Hans Fall. By late accounts from Rotterdam, that city seems to be in a high state of philosophical excitement. Indeed, phenomena have there occurred of a nature so completely unexpected, so entirely novel, so utterly at variance with preconceived opinions, as to leave no doubt on my mind that long ere this all Europe is in an uproar, all physics in a ferment, all reason and astronomy together by the ears. It appears that on the blank day of blank, I am not positive about the date, a vast crowd of people, for purposes not specifically mentioned, were assembled in the great square of the exchange in the well-conditioned city of Rotterdam. The day was warm, unusually so for the season. There was hardly a breath of air stirring, and the multitude were in no bad humor at being now and then besprinkled with friendly showers of momentary duration that fell from large white masses of cloud, which checkered in a fitful manner the blue vault of the firmament. Nevertheless, about noon, a slight but remarkable agitation became apparent in the assembly. The clattering of ten thousand tongues succeeded, and in an instant afterward, ten thousand faces were upturned toward the heavens, Ten thousand pipes descended simultaneously from the corners of ten thousand mouths, and a shout, which could be compared to nothing but the roaring of Niagara, resounded long, loudly, and furiously through all the environs of Rotterdam. The origin of this hubbub soon became sufficiently evident. From behind the huge bulk of one of those sharply defined masses of cloud already mentioned, was seen slowly to emerge into an open area of blue space, a queer, heterogeneous, but apparently solid substance, so oddly shaped, so whimsically put together, as not to be in any manner comprehended, and never to be sufficiently admired by the host of sturdy burghers who stood open-mouthed below. What could it be? In the name of all the vrows and devils in Rotterdam, what could it possibly portend? No one knew, no one could imagine, no one, not even the burgomaster Meinheer Superbus von Underduck, had the slightest clue by which to unravel the mystery. So, as nothing more reasonable could be done, every one to a man replaced his pipe carefully in the corner of his mouth, and cocking up his right eye towards the phenomenon, puffed, paused, waddled about, and grunted significantly, then waddled back, grunted, paused, and finally puffed again. In the meantime, however, lower and still lower toward the goodly city came the object of so much curiosity and the cause of so much smoke. In a very few minutes it arrived near enough to be accurately discerned. It appeared to be, yes, it was undoubtedly a species of balloon, but surely no such balloon had ever been seen in Rotterdam before. For who, let me ask, ever heard of a balloon manufactured entirely of dirty newspapers? No man in Holland, certainly, yet here, under the very noses of the people, or rather at some distance above their noses, was the identical thing in question, and composed, I have it on the best authority, of the precise material which no one had ever before known to be used for a similar purpose. It was an egregious insult to the good sense of the burghers of Rotterdam. As to the shape of the phenomenon, it was even still more reprehensible, being little or nothing better than a huge fool's cap turned upside down. And this similitude was regarded as by no means lessened when, upon nearer inspection, there was perceived a large tassel depending from its apex, and around the upper rim, or base of the cone, a circle of little instruments resembling sheep bells, which kept up a continual tinkling to the tune of Betty Martin. 
but still worse, suspended by blue ribbons to the end of this fantastic machine, there hung, by way of car, an enormous drab beaver hat, with a brim superlatively broad, and a hemispherical crown with a black band and a silver buckle. It is, however, somewhat remarkable that many citizens of Rotterdam swore to having seen the same hat repeatedly before, and indeed the whole assembly seemed to regard it with eyes of familiarity, while the Frau Gretel Fall, upon sight of it, uttered an exclamation of joyful surprise, and declared it to be the identical hat of her good man himself. Now this was a circumstance the more to be observed, as Fall, with three companions, had actually disappeared from Rotterdam about five years before, in a very sudden and unaccountable manner, and up to the date of this narrative all attempts had failed of obtaining any intelligence concerning them whatsoever. To be sure, some bones, which were thought to be human, mixed up with a quantity of odd-looking rubbish, had been lately discovered in a retired situation to the east of Rotterdam, and some people went so far as to imagine that in this spot a foul murder had been committed, and that the sufferers were in all probability Hans Fall and his associates. But to return. The balloon, for such no doubt it was, had now descended to within a hundred feet of the earth, allowing the crowd below a sufficiently distinct view of the person of its occupant. This was, in truth, a very droll little somebody. He could not have been more than two feet in height, but this altitude, little as it was, would have been sufficient to destroy his equilibrium and tilt him over the edge of his tiny car, but for the intervention of a circular rim reaching as high as the breast and rigged on to the cords of the balloon. The body of the little man was more than proportionately broad, giving to his entire figure a rotundity highly absurd. His feet, of course, could not be seen at all, although a horny substance of a suspicious nature was occasionally protruded through a rent in the bottom of the car, or, to speak more properly, in the top of the hat. His hands were enormously large, his hair was extremely gray, and collected in a queue behind. His nose was prodigiously long, crooked and inflammatory, his eyes full, brilliant and acute. His chin and cheeks, although wrinkled with age, were broad, puffy, and double. But ears of any kind or character there was not a semblance to be discovered upon any portion of his head. This odd little gentleman was dressed in a loose surtout of sky-blue satin, with tight breeches to match, fastened with silver buckles at the knees. His vest was of some bright yellow material, a white taffety cap was set jauntily on one side of his head, and to complete his equipment, a blood-red silk handkerchief enveloped his throat and fell down in a dainty manner upon his bosom, in a fantastic bow-knot of super-eminent dimensions. Having descended, as I said before, to about one hundred feet from the surface of the earth, the little old gentleman was suddenly seized with a fit of trepidation, and appeared disinclined to make any nearer approach to terra firma. Throwing out, therefore, a quantity of sand from a canvas bag, which he lifted with great difficulty, he became stationary in an instant. He then proceeded, in a hurried and agitated manner, to extract from a side pocket in his surtout a large Morocco pocket-book. This he poised suspiciously in his hand, then eyed it with an air of extreme surprise, and was evidently astonished at its weight. He at length opened it, and drawing therefrom a huge letter sealed with red sealing-wax and tied carefully with red tape, let it fall precisely at the feet of the burgermaster, Superbus von Underduck. His Excellency stooped to take it up. But the aeronaut, still greatly discomposed, and having apparently no farther business to detain him in Rotterdam, began at this moment to make busy preparations for departure, and it being necessary to discharge a portion of ballast to enable him to reascend, the half-dozen bags which he threw out one after another, without taking the trouble to empty their contents, tumbled every one of them, most unfortunately, upon the back of the burgermaster, 
and rolled him over and over no less than one hundred and twenty times in the face of every man in Rotterdam. It is not to be supposed, however, that the great underduck suffered this impertinence on the part of the little old man to pass off with impunity. It is said, on the contrary, that during each and every one of his one-and-twenty circumvolutions he emitted no less than one-and-twenty distinct and furious whiffs from his pipe, to which he held fast the whole time with all his might, and to which he intends holding fast until the day of his death. In the meantime, the balloon arose like a lark, and, soaring far away above the city, at length drifted quietly behind a cloud similar to that from which it had so oddly emerged, and was thus lost for ever to the wondering eyes of the good citizens of Rotterdam. All attention was now directed to the letter, the descent of which, and the consequences attending thereupon, had proved so fatally subversive of both person and personal dignity to His Excellency, the illustrious Burgomaster, Mynheer Superbus von Underduck. That functionary, however, had not failed during his circumgyratory movements to bestow a thought upon the important subject of securing the packet in question, which was seen upon inspection to have fallen into the most proper hands, being actually addressed to himself and Professor Rubadub in their official capacities of President and Vice President of the Rotterdam College of Astronomy. It was accordingly opened by those dignitaries upon the spot and found to contain the following extraordinary and indeed very serious communications. To their excellencies von Underduck and Rubadub, President and Vice President of the States College of Astronomers in the city of Rotterdam, your excellencies may perhaps be able to remember a humble artisan, by name Hans Fall, and by occupation a mender of bellows who, with three others, disappeared from Rotterdam about five years ago, in a manner which must have been considered by all parties at once sudden and extremely unaccountable. If, however, it so please your excellencies, I, the writer of this communication, am the identical Hans Fall himself. It is well known to most of my fellow citizens that for the period of forty years I continued to occupy the little square brick building at the head of the alley called Sauerkraut, in which I resided at the time of my disappearance. My ancestors have also resided therein time out of mind, they as well as myself steadily following the respectable and indeed lucrative profession of mending of bellows. For to speak the truth until of late, that the heads of all the people have been set agog with politics, no better business than my own could an honest citizen of Rotterdam either desire or deserve. Credit was good, employment was never wanting, and on all hands there was no lack of either money or goodwill. But, as I was saying, we soon began to feel the effects of liberty and long speeches and radicalism and all that sort of thing. People who were formerly the very best customers in the world had now not a moment of time to think of us at all. They had, so they said, as much as they could do to read about the revolutions and keep up with the march of intellect and the spirit of the age. If a fire wanted fanning, it could readily be fanned with a newspaper, and as the government grew weaker, I have no doubt that leather and iron acquired durability in proportion, for in a very short time there was not a pair of bellows in all Rotterdam that ever stood in need of a stitch or required the assistance of a hammer. This was a state of things not to be endured. I soon grew as poor as a rat, and having a wife and children to provide for, my burdens at length became intolerable, and I spent hour after hour in reflecting upon the most convenient method of putting an end to my life. Duns, in the meantime, left me little leisure for contemplation. My house was literally besieged from morning till night, so that I began to rave and foam and fret like a caged tiger against the bars of his enclosure. There were three fellows in particular who worried me beyond endurance, keeping watch continually about my door and threatening me with the law. 
Upon these three I internally vowed the bitterest revenge, if ever I should be so happy as to get them within my clutches, and I believe nothing in the world but the pleasure of this anticipation prevented me from putting my plan of suicide into immediate execution by blowing my brains out with a blunderbuss. I thought it best, however, to dissemble my wrath, and to treat them with promises and fair words, until, by some good turn of fate, an opportunity of vengeance should be afforded me. One day, having given my creditors the slip and feeling more than usually dejected, I continued for a long time to wander about the most obscure streets without object whatever, until at length I chanced to stumble against the corner of a bookseller's stall. Seeing a chair close at hand for the use of customers, I threw myself doggedly into it, and, hardly knowing why, opened the pages of the first volume which came within my reach. It proved to be a small pamphlet treatise on speculative astronomy, written either by Professor Enke of Berlin, or by a Frenchman of somewhat similar name. I had some little tincture of information on matters of this nature, and soon became more and more absorbed in the contents of the book, reading it actually through twice before I woke to a recollection of what was passing around me. By this time it began to grow dark, and I directed my steps toward home, but the treatise had made an indelible impression on my mind, and as I sauntered along the dusky streets, I revolved carefully over in my memory the wild and sometimes unintelligible reasonings of the writer. There are some particular passages which affected my imagination in a powerful and extraordinary manner. The longer I meditated upon these, the more intense grew the interest which had been excited within me. The limited nature of my education in general, and more especially my ignorance on subjects connected with natural philosophy, so far from rendering me diffident of my own ability to comprehend what I had read, or inducing me to mistrust the many vague notions which had arisen in consequence, merely served as a farther stimulus to imagination, and I was vain enough, or perhaps reasonable enough, to doubt whether those crude ideas which, arising in ill-regulated minds, have all the appearance, may not often in effect possess all the force, the reality and other inherent properties of instinct or intuition, whether to proceed a step farther, profundity itself might not, in matters of a purely speculative nature, be detected as a legitimate source of falsity and error. In other words, I believed, and still do believe, that truth is frequently of its own essence superficial, and that in many cases the depth lies more in the abysses where we seek her than in the actual situations wherein she may be found. Nature herself seemed to afford me corroboration of these ideas. In the contemplation of the heavenly bodies it struck me forcibly that I could not distinguish a star with nearly as much precision when I gazed on it with earnest, direct, and undeviating attention as when I suffered my eye only to glance in its vicinity alone. I was not, of course, at that time aware that this apparent paradox was occasioned by the center of the visual area being less susceptible of feeble impressions of light than the exterior portions of the retina. This knowledge, and some of another kind, came afterwards in the course of an eventful five years, during which I have dropped the prejudices of my former humble situation in life, and forgotten the bellows-mender in far different occupations. But at the epoch of which I speak, the analogy which a casual observation of a star offered to the conclusions I had already drawn struck me with the force of positive confirmation, and I then finally made up my mind to the course which I afterwards pursued. It was late when I reached home, and I went immediately to bed. My mind, however, was too much occupied to sleep, and I lay the whole night buried in meditation. Arising early in the morning and contriving again to escape the vigilance of my creditors, I repaired eagerly to the bookseller's stall and laid out what little ready money I possessed in the purchase of some volumes of mechanics and practical astronomy. Having arrived at home safely with these, 
I devoted every spare moment to their perusal, and soon made such proficiency in studies of this nature as I thought sufficient for the execution of my plan. In the intervals of this period I made every endeavor to conciliate the three creditors who had given me so much annoyance. In this I finally succeeded, partly by selling enough of my household furniture to satisfy a moiety of their claim, and partly by a promise of paying the balance upon completion of a little project which I told them I had in view, and for assistance in which I solicited their services. By these means, for they were ignorant men, I found little difficulty in gaining them over to my purpose. Matters being thus arranged, I contrived by the aid of my wife, and with the greatest secrecy and caution, to dispose of what property I had remaining, and to borrow in small sums under various pretenses, and without paying any attention to my future means of repayment, no inconsiderable quantity of ready money. With the means thus accruing, I proceeded to procure at intervals cambric muslin, very fine, in pieces of twelve yards each, twine, a lot of the varnish of caoutchouc, a large and deep basket of wicker work, made to order, and several other articles necessary in the construction and equipment of a balloon of extraordinary dimensions. This I directed my wife to make up as soon as possible, and gave her all requisite information as to the particular method of proceeding. In the meantime I worked up the twine into a network of sufficient dimensions, rigged it with a hoop and the necessary cords, bought a quadrant, a compass, a spyglass, a common barometer with some important modifications, and two astronomical instruments not so generally known. I then took opportunities of conveying by night, to a retired situation east of Rotterdam, five iron-bound casks, to contain about fifty gallons each, and one of a larger size, six tinned ware tubes three inches in diameter, properly shaped and ten feet in length, a quantity of a particular metallic substance, or semi-metal, which I shall not name, and a dozen demijohns of a very common acid. The gas to be formed from these latter materials is a gas never yet generated by any other person than myself, or at least never applied to any similar purpose. The secret I would make no difficulty in disclosing, but that it of right belongs to a citizen of Nans in France, by whom I was conditionally communicated to myself. The same individual submitted to me, without being at all aware of my intentions, a method of constructing balloons from the membrane of a certain animal, through which substance any escape of gas was nearly an impossibility. I found it, however, altogether too expensive, and was not sure, upon the whole, whether cambric muslin, with a coating of gum caoutchouc, was not equally as good. I mention this circumstance because I think it probable that hereafter the individual in question may attempt a balloon ascension with the novel gas and material I have spoken of, and I do not wish to deprive him of the honor of a very singular invention. On the spot which I intended each of the smaller casks to occupy respectively during the inflation of the balloon, I privately dug a hole two feet deep, the holes forming in this manner a circle twenty-five feet in diameter. In the center of this circle, being the station designed for the large cask, I also dug a hole three feet in depth. In each of the five smaller holes I deposited a canister containing fifty pounds, and in the larger one a keg holding one hundred fifty pounds of cannon powder. These, the keg and canisters, I connected in a proper manner with covered trains, and having let into one of the canisters the end of about four feet of slow match, I covered up the hole, and placed the cask over it, leaving the other end of the match protruding about an inch, and barely visible beyond the cask. I then filled up the remaining holes, and placed the barrels over them in their destined situation. Besides the articles above enumerated, I conveyed to the depot, and there secreted one of M. Grimm's improvements upon the apparatus for condensation of the atmospheric air. I found this machine, however, to require considerable alteration before it could be adapted to the purposes to which I intended making it applicable. But with severe labor and unremitting perseverance, I at length met with entire success in all my preparations. My balloon was soon completed. 
It would contain more than 40,000 cubic feet of gas, would take me up easily, I calculated, with all my implements, and, if I managed rightly, with 175 pounds of ballast into the bargain. It had received three coats of varnish, and I found the cambric muslin to answer all the purposes of silk itself, quite as strong and a good deal less expensive. Everything being now ready, I exacted from my wife an oath of secrecy in relation to all my actions from the day of my first visit to the bookseller's stall, and promising on my part to return as soon as circumstances would permit, I gave her what little money I had left and bade her farewell. Indeed, I had no fear on her account. She was what people call a notable woman, and could manage matters in the world without my assistance. I believe, to tell the truth, she always looked upon me as an idle boy, a mere make-weight, good for nothing but building castles in the air, and was rather glad to get rid of me. It was a dark night when I bade her good-bye, and taking with me, as aides de camp, the three creditors who had given me so much trouble, we carried the balloon with the car and accoutrements by a roundabout way to the station where the other articles were deposited. We there found them all unmolested, and I proceeded immediately to business. It was the first of April. The night, as I said before, was dark. There was not a star to be seen, and a drizzling rain falling at intervals rendered us very uncomfortable. But my chief anxiety was concerning the balloon, which, in spite of the varnish with which it was defended, began to grow rather heavy with the moisture. The powder also was liable to damage. I therefore kept my three duns working with great diligence, pounding down ice around the central cask, and stirring the acid in the others. They did not cease, however, importuning me with questions as to what I intended to do with all this apparatus, and expressed much dissatisfaction at the terrible labor I made them undergo. They could not perceive, so they said, what good was likely to result from their getting wet to the skin, merely to take part in such horrible incantations. I began to get uneasy and worked away with all my might, for I verily believed the idiots supposed that I had entered into a compact with the devil, and that, in short, what I was now doing was nothing better than it should be. I was therefore in great fear of their leaving me altogether. I contrived, however, to pacify them by promises of payment of all scores in full, as soon as I could bring the present business to a termination. To these speeches they gave, of course, their own interpretation, fancying, no doubt, that at all events I should come into possession of vast quantities of ready money, and provided I paid them all I owed, and a trifle more in consideration of their services, I dare say they cared very little what became of either my soul or my carcass. In about four hours and a half I found the balloon sufficiently inflated. I attached the car, therefore, and put all my implements in it, not forgetting the condensing apparatus, a copious supply of water, and a large quantity of provisions, such as pemmican, in which much nutriment is contained in comparatively little bulk. I also secured in the car a pair of pigeons and a cat. It was now nearly daybreak, and I thought it high time to take my departure. Dropping a lighted cigar on the ground, as if by accident, I took the opportunity, in stooping to pick it up, of igniting privately the piece of slow match, whose end, as I said before, protruded a very little beyond the lower rim of one of the smaller casks. This maneuver was totally unperceived on the part of the three duns, and jumping into the car I immediately cut the single cord which held me to the earth, and was pleased to find that I shot upward, carrying with all ease one hundred and seventy-five pounds of leaden ballast, and able to have carried up as many more. Scarcely, however, had I attained the height of fifty yards, when roaring and rumbling up after me in the most horrible and tumultuous manner came so dense a hurricane of fire and smoke and sulphur and legs and arms and gravel and burning wood and blazing metal that my very heart sunk within me, and I fell down in the bottom of the car, trembling with unmitigated terror. Indeed, I now perceived that I had entirely overdone the business, and that the main consequences of the shock were yet to be experienced. 
Accordingly, in less than a second, I felt all the blood in my body rushing to my temples, and immediately thereupon a concussion which I shall never forget burst abruptly through the night and seemed to rip the very firmament asunder. When I afterward had time for reflection, I did not fail to attribute the extreme violence of the explosion, as regarded myself, to its proper cause, my situation directly above it, and in the line of its greatest power. But at the time I thought only of preserving my life. The balloon at first collapsed, then furiously expanded, then whirled round and round with horrible velocity, and finally, reeling and staggering like a drunken man, hurled me with great force over the rim of the car, and left me dangling at a terrific height with my head downward and my face outwards by a piece of slender cord about three feet in length, which hung accidentally through a crevice near the bottom of the wickerwork, and in which, as I fell, my left foot became providentially entangled. It is impossible, utterly impossible, to form any adequate idea of the horror of my situation. I gasped convulsively for breath. A shudder resembling a fit of the ague agitated every nerve and muscle of my frame. I felt my eyes starting from their sockets. A horrible nausea overwhelmed me, and at length I fainted away. How long I remained in this state it is impossible to say. It must, however, have been no inconsiderable time, for when I partially recovered the sense of existence I found the day breaking, the balloon at a prodigious height over a wilderness of ocean, and not a trace of land to be discovered far and wide within the limits of the vast horizon. My sensations, however, upon thus recovering, were by no means so rife with agony as might have been anticipated. Indeed, there was much of incipient madness in the calm survey which I began to take of my situation. I drew up to my eyes each of my hands one after the other, and wondered what occurrence could have given rise to the swelling of the veins, and the horrible blackness of the fingernails. I afterward carefully examined my head, shaking it repeatedly and feeling it with minute attention, until I succeeded in satisfying myself that it was not, as I had more than half suspected, larger than my balloon. Then in a knowing manner I felt in both my breeches pockets, and missing therefrom a set of tablets and a toothpick case, endeavored to account for their disappearance, and not being able to do so, felt inexpressibly chagrined. It now occurred to me that I suffered great uneasiness in the joint of my left ankle, and a dim consciousness of my situation began to glimmer through my mind. But strange to say, I was neither astonished nor horror-stricken. If I felt any emotion at all, it was a kind of chuckling satisfaction at the cleverness I was about to display in extricating myself from this dilemma, and I never, for a moment, looked upon my ultimate safety as a question susceptible of doubt. For a few minutes I remained wrapped in the profoundest meditation. I have a distinct recollection of frequently compressing my lips, putting my forefinger to the side of my nose and making use of other gesticulations and grimaces common to men who, at ease in their armchairs, meditate upon matters of intricacy or importance. Having, as I thought, sufficiently collected my ideas, I now, with great caution and deliberation, put my hands behind my back and unfastened the large iron buckle which belonged to the waistband of my inexpressibles. This buckle had three teeth, which, being somewhat rusty, turned with great difficulty on their axis. I brought them, however, after some trouble, at right angles to the body of the buckle, and was glad to find them remain firm in that position. Holding the instrument thus obtained within my teeth, I now proceeded to untie the knot of my cravat. I had to rest several times before I could accomplish this maneuver, but it was at length accomplished. To one end of the cravat I then made fast the buckle, and the other end I tied for greater security tightly around my wrist. Drawing now my body upwards, with a prodigious exertion of muscular force, I succeeded at the very first trial in throwing the buckle over the car, and entangling it, as I had anticipated, in the circular rim of the wickerwork. 
My body was now inclined towards the side of the car, at an angle of about forty-five degrees, but it must not be understood that I was therefore only forty-five degrees below the perpendicular. So far from it, I still lay nearly level with the plane of the horizon, for the change of situation which I had acquired had forced the bottom of the car considerably outwards from my position, which was accordingly one of the most imminent and deadly peril. It should be remembered, however, that when I fell in the first instance from the car, if I had fallen with my face turned toward the balloon instead of turned outwardly from it as it actually was, or if, in the second place, the cord by which I was suspended had chanced to hang over the upper edge instead of through a crevice near the bottom of the car, I say it may be readily conceived that in either of these supposed cases I should have been unable to accomplish even as much as I had now accomplished, and the wonderful adventures of Hans Fall would have been utterly lost to posterity. I had, therefore, every reason to be grateful, although in point of fact I was too stupid to be anything at all, and hung for perhaps a quarter of an hour in that extraordinary manner, without making the slightest farther exertion whatsoever, and in a singularly tranquil state of idiotic enjoyment. But this feeling did not fail to die rapidly away, and thereunto succeeded horror and dismay and a chilling sense of utter helplessness and ruin. In fact, the blood so long accumulating in the vessels of my head and throat, and which had hitherto buoyed up my spirits with madness and delirium, had now begun to retire within their proper channels, and the distinctness which was thus added to my perception of the danger merely served to deprive me of the self-possession and courage to encounter it. But this weakness was, luckily for me, of no very long duration. In good time came to my rescue the spirit of despair, and with frantic cries and struggles I jerked my way bodily upwards, till at length, clutching with a vice-like grip the long-desired rim, I writhed my person over it and fell headlong and shuddering within the car. It was not until some time afterward that I recovered myself sufficiently to attend to the ordinary cares of the balloon. I then, however, examined it with attention, and found it, to my great relief, uninjured. My implements were all safe, and fortunately I had lost neither ballast nor provisions. Indeed, I had so well secured them in their places that such an accident was entirely out of the question. Looking at my watch, I found it six o'clock. I was still rapidly ascending, and my barometer gave a present altitude of three and three-quarter miles. Immediately beneath me in the ocean lay a small black object, slightly oblong in shape, seemingly about the size and in every way bearing a great resemblance to one of those childish toys called a domino. Bringing my telescope to bear upon it, I plainly discerned it to be a British ninety-four gun ship, close-hauled and pitching heavily in the sea, with her head to the west-southwest. Besides this ship I saw nothing but the ocean and the sky and the sun which had long arisen. It is now high time that I should explain to your excellencies the object of my perilous voyage. Your excellencies will bear in mind that distressed circumstances in Rotterdam had at length driven me to the resolution of committing suicide. It was not, however, that to life itself I had any positive disgust, but that I was harassed beyond endurance by the adventitious miseries attending my situation. In this state of mind, wishing to live, yet wearied with life, the treatise at the stall of the bookseller opened a resource to my imagination. I then finally made up my mind. I determined to depart, yet live, to leave the world, yet continue to exist. In short, to drop enigmas, I resolved let what would ensue to force a passage, if I could, to the moon. Now, lest I should be supposed more of a madman than I actually am, I will detail as well as I am able the considerations which led me to believe that an achievement of this nature, although without doubt difficult, and incontestably full of danger, was not absolutely, to a bold spirit, beyond the confines of the possible. End of the Unparalleled Adventures of One Hans Fall, Part 1
Recording by Sandy Gunther.